Okay, for our task today, we're going to be looking at recruitment posters, and this collection is all taken from the Imperial War Museum. Uh, there's a fantastic collection of World War One posters here, and there are, some of them are taken from a book in my classroom called Weapons of Mass Communication. So uh, certainly in the way before, like almost a hundred years before the uh, the the advent of social media, Twitter, Facebook. Uh, governments needed powerful ways to communicate to their population. Uh, at the beginning of the war, a lot of these positive propagandist posters are intended to create the sense of excitement and euphoria, uh, patriotism to stir people's hearts, to make people feel proud to go into war for their country, but also to make them feel perhaps a sense of shame, perhaps a sense of cowardice as well. What I'm going to do is take you through a few of them, and then you can uh, get some tips from me about how to take a poster and analyse it. And we will come through a procedure where we will analyse the, the composition of the overall frame. We'll look at the content, we'll look at the language, we'll look at the structure. And we'll definitely look at things like colour connotation and symbolism. Uh, this is one of the most iconic war posters going. Britons, join your, Britons, join your country's army. Uh, this caption here at the bottom is taken from the Imperial War Museum's historians uh, and they say this is perhaps the most famous poster from the First World War. It shows Field Marshal Lord Kitchener appealing for people to join the British Army. It was first produced in 1914 but has taken on a more iconic status since the war when it was not widely circulated outside of the London area. However, its striking visual appeal was picked up by other artists, including in the USA, where the image of Kitchener was replaced by Uncle Sam. So here is, uh, well, I think you can start with the most powerful and arresting feature. Um, for your presentations, I'd, I'd like you to all include uh, this, this textual accompaniment. You can use that as the, as the introduction. You can see it's actually there on all of the posters. So you can use that as the introduction, some facts, facts and statistics about who published it, where was it published, who was the intended audience. And then I, I look at the, the image itself, and clearly the most striking thing is, I think, uh, this dominant image of Lord Kitchener. What a moustache. What a powerful man this must be. So Lord Kitchener was the, the head of the entire British Armed Forces, and Lord Kitchener there can be seen sternly fixing the reader with that gaze and pointing with all the command of the power of his position at the, at the reader and presumably at young British males who could potentially join the armed forces. And we know that this is a serious matter as well. There's no hint of a smile on his face. He is demanding that you join. And he's pointing directly to uh, the individual on the street. So you can imagine like people walking up and down past the recruitment office. At this time, there would be soldiers in the streets, uh, groups of bat battalions forming. There'd be quite a uh, climatic atmosphere in the streets as well, like this anticipation of people heading off. And at this time in the war, it would be like groups of people from factories or football teams or uh, mines, people working together in lads, lads armies uh, to go off and fight together. So if you weren't part of this uh, movement, then you, you could be deemed a coward. Anyway, looking up here, we've got Britons, join your country's army, God save the king. So... Here, Britons, uh, the subject then is, is collectively everyone who lives within the British Isles. And it is in a large font, a huge font at the top of the poster. And that's to uh, uh, attract attention uh, to the audience so we know exactly who Lord Kitchener is speaking to. And there's a, a combination at the beginning at the top with this masthead title of Britons wants you and the pointed finger. So there's a connection between text, purpose and audience. The purpose is that they want you to join your country's army. 
There's an exclamatory phrase there because this is important and exciting and vital. And at the end, uh, we know this is a patriotic propaganda poster because it says, God save the king. Now, earlier, uh, late last week, we were looking at a lot of, uh, a lot of the poems were positive propagandist poems. And, and this definitely fits this patriotic propagandist um, depiction of the war at the beginning when people were very uh, motivated and inspired by the brave adventures that they could have overseas. We will see in subsequent lessons with some uh, very powerful, moving and heart-rending, viciously horrific uh, images that are presented in poems like Dolce e Decorum S, um, an anthem for doomed youth, and the attack poems by Siegfried Sassoon and Wilfred Owen, two of the, the godfathers of First World War poetry. We will see just how devastating uh, the war actually was. But at this stage, these posters generally accompany the idea that the war was a positive thing, it could make a man of you, you could go and defend your king, go and defend your country, have an adventure abroad. And that's what's being reinforced with this powerful poster. The disembodied head of Lord Kitchener in the very centre of the frame highlights his importance, but it's also kind of shocking. We don't usually get that image of someone who is so centred. Uh, often posters you might see in the posters that you study that the rule of thirds is used, where there are parallel lines that run across uh, vertically and horizontally. You can imagine that the image is set to one of the, the quadrants of those uh, third thirds on on the page but here he is an intensely uh, close up of Lord Kitchener staring directly at you and this grabs your attention and would make a young British soldier want to go and join the army. Okay so you've got uh, other posters here there's a couple more there this one relies on the idea of fear the guilt uh, these women are staring out of the window and look they are they are clinging together but there's a a look of a smile there and this this female character here, the wife presumably and the daughter and the, the son heading off watching their husband and father head off to war. There's a look of ad adulation and adoration uh, from her. Women of Britain say, go. That is a command phrase. That is a modal command. There's an exclamatory phrase. The use of font has been increase there on that modal command go and underline to emphasize its importance. There's color connotation. Uh, unlike the red here, which is all about stark immediacy, uh, uh, not danger necessarily, but like importance and the vitality of the mission. Um, this one is like clear and white and speaks collectively to all women of Britain. So there is no there is no uh, op opposition here. There's no one saying stay at home. All women of Britain say go. And if you do go, the implied message there to the other audience, which is the, the, make, the audience is to the females at home to make sure they support and encourage the men to go to war because it's the right thing to do. But also for these soldiers here who know that they want to gain the respect of their uh, girlfriends, wives, mothers, daughters, and go off and do the right thing. And look at this window. This is a powerful metaphor. This huge window is wide open. And what does it look out upon? It looks out upon a sun-drenched meadow with these men, fresh-faced, neat, uniformed soldiers, marching in step together, heading out, bright faces, looking to the future, looking towards success, and so this is a window of opportunity for the nation here. When he comes back, he will come back a hero and they will love him all the more. Uh, the third and final one is a little bit different here. So we've got the Women's Army Auxiliary Corps established in 1916. So this is a bit later on in the war, halfway through the war. In fact, the First World War ran from 1914 to 1918. So later on, uh, women joined this army corps and carried out a large number of non-combatant tasks in France. So while women were working in the factories back at home and taking over a lot of the male-dominated jobs like working in the fields, farming, agriculture, produce, 
and also working in the factories to produce the arms and uh, the munitions and all of the vital resources like the tanks, uh, the jeeps, the, uh, the, the shells, the weapons, the uniforms that would service those fighting on the front lines. There was a lot more female power. This was actually a catalyst for the beginning of the suffragette movement. So women, because of the sacrifices they made in the factories and the fields and out in France, close to where the battle lines were, especially the, the nurse, the nurses who were working in the, 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 the horrid conditions of the field hospitals, this was actually a very empowering moment for female rights. So hmm, there is some kind of positive to, to gain from the First World War, I suppose. And here we can see this, uh, the use of silhouettes. So uh, we have, again, the white, red, and black. These are stark, immediate colours that speak of the vitality and importance of the mission that's being carried out. And I suppose the black is being used as a silhouette here because it, it allows us to implant anybody on the identity of this tractor driver here. And also here, we can, we can tell, I suppose, because they are wearing dresses, and hats that these are females, but this this could be anyone as well. So it's quite a um, an egalitarian, equal uh, message where, where like a woman can implant herself in on a male role. Um, so I don't know what they're doing here. I suppose they might be checking. Like it looks like they've got baskets of flour, or they're milling they're milling like uh, m milling the corn. So working in the factories, working in farm positions. Uh, here they seem to be sewing. Um, yep, dining clothes, maybe making a, well, parachutes or uh, perhaps the, the uniforms that would be sent out, maybe maybe some winter weather clothing, because at the beginning of the war they thought it would be over within a matter of months, but the, the war went on long and hard. You can see some of the tough conditions actually in a brilliant new film, 1917, which is uh, directed by Sam Mendes and tells the stories of two soldiers, two are almost like brothers who go off uh, in, to try and deliver an important message. If you have the chance, go and go and watch that film. If you if you wear your face mask and get your parents' permission, um, and here women actually working with hammers. So they, here they are in in factories, then like hammering nails, bending bending iron, creating weapons. And in all cases, this sort of the red behind them gives the idea of like blood sacrifice, uh, the unity of the women to the crown because the red and white and black are the same colours of the crown of England, King George's crown. And the text here, the language says that women are urgently wanted for the WAAC Women's Army Auxiliary Corps. Work at home and abroad with the forces. Cooks, waitresses, clerks, drivers, mechanics, all kinds of domestic workers and women in many other capacities to take the place of men. And they are promised in bullet point form Good wages, uniform, quarters and rations. Quarters is living quarters as well. So for many, many women who are living in a patriarchal society, stuck at home, often uh, just being married off at a young age, not having the same educational opportunities, and then going from their, you know, really being a, a possession of their father to the possession of a husband. This is a moment where women can go off and live and work and contribute to society. And that fulfilling capacity uh, actually gave them the the motivation to uh, to form the suffragette movement which would see post second world war i think in 1919 the very first women's votes under a a a, 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 a an ev a evolutionary democratic system uh, the sacrifice of men in this war as well also led to the expansion the enfranchisement of working class males. So a very important time in sociological and political history. So that's all from me. I'm going to stop the recording now. I wish you all well. Uh, and you can see your groups here. Uh, so Giuseppe and Gordon, I'd like you to individually have a look at this poster and then create a Google Slides presentation or you can create a little... Uh, recording and send that over to me. Rachel and Harvey, you're going to do this one too. So have a think about the content and the structure and the language and the colour and the symbolism of all of the images that are there and try to produce maybe like a two-minute
presentation or detailed Google Slides notes for this task. Good luck and I'll be in touch soon. All the best.